Welcome to the Art of Conscious Living. Today, my guest is Kelly Bryson, Nonviolent Communication. I'm so pleased to have him here in the studio to talk about his book, Don't Be Nice, Be Real. I love the title, love the book, and we're going to be speaking about this and so much more. Kelly, thank you for being here today. You're welcome. We have very important things to talk about and very profound things that are very meaningful, that people can learn a lot, and um, to help them to be more in their body, to be more mm -hmm. authentic, and to do it with a lot of ease and flow to it. Yeah, exactly. To be more expressed, to be more alive, to be more real. Just to say what's alive in me without making you wrong, for example, is a powerful skill in itself. Even just to give you the feedback you need in order to grow as a social being. And this work is based on the work of Marshall Rosenberg. Yes. He was a nonviolent communication. He was a therapist. For those who don't know about the work. He's a psychologist and uh, I met him in 83, I think. He was doing a conference for the humanistic educators in Philadelphia. And I was getting my master's degree at that time in, in uh, humanistic psychology. And I went to this little presentation he did and he, he pulled a couple from the audience and brought them up on the stage and began working with them and teaching them this little process, very simple process called nonviolent communication. And in a matter of about 10 minutes, he had them resolve a conflict they had been working on for eight years. And it was beautiful. You could just feel the relief that came into their bodies and the understanding that went on between the two and the connection that they made just by changing their language from violent to nonviolent communication. And he uses two animals <laughs> as an examples, and the animals are the giraffe and the jekyll. Yeah. And what is that all about? Well, it's teaching tools that uh, kind of symbols for a certain kind of communication. We use the giraffe because you have to stick your neck out, make yourself vulnerable, say what's really real, what, say what's in your body from the neck down, not just from the head up, the neck up. And also the giraffe has the largest heart of any land animal, so it takes courage to be authentic in the world. It takes courage to be, re to be real and to deal with what it stimulates in other people in a nonviolent way. And then the jackal, that came from an old story that Marshall tells about, do you still want to be working with this old jackal husband of yours? And The jackals eat from the ground, they, they don't eat from heaven, they eat from the earth. And their whole language is built on blame and criticism and make wrong and demands, demands analysis and blame. Blame and judgment. Yeah. Marshall says that all judgments are the tragic expressions of pain and unmet needs. And if I was in my heart and coming from my heart, I could say the pain and the unmet needs instead of the judgment of you. So it's about separating your needs from the emotions mm -hmm. and expressing your needs and knowing that you can separate it from the emotions such as your emotions could be anger, your emotions could be emotional pain, but the need is something you need to ex The need express. is the power of the communication, really the energy. Somebody said that communication is 80% uh, uh, energy and 20% content. So the energy of the, need, of the communication comes from naming and expressing the need, not just the feelings. So it isn't enough to say I'm feeling sad, but when you talk about the need for connection, the need for uh, companionship is that's behind that and express that from your heart and let people see that. That touches people's hearts. That opens their hearts to having empathy for you and wanting to care for you and give to you. And so in a kind of, holistic way, it would be a lot of akin to getting in touch with the cause instead of looking yeah, at the symptoms. Something like that. I'm pointing to also to the solution. I'm needing connection, communication, companionship, not just pointing to the problem, I feel left out by you, or I feel abandoned by you, some kind of feelings that actually comes out as blame and does not inspire empathy or caring very much, as much as the vulnerable feelings would. I'm sad, I really want more, more sense of connection and companionship. Would you be willing to spend some time with me? Henceforth, the name nonviolent communication. Nonviolent. A lot of people are speaking in a violent way and they don't even know they're speaking They don't even know way. it. It's tragic. I see it all the time in families and couples. They don't even know. Even simple thing like, I feel unheard by you or I feel left out. Or even those kind of things actually have a blame built into them 
And you'll get much better results if you were to say something like, I feel sad or scared or disappointment, and I really would like you to consider doing this. You're much more likely to get the kind of cooperation that you're wanting from that than by telling people, by, by saying feelings that have judgments mixed up in them. So what I'm hearing you say is that essentially you are allow yourself to be vulnerable. Exactly. It's very important of the exactly. vulnerability. Uh, in judgment, there's no vulnerability there. No. You're guarded, you're blaming the other no. person. But the more vulnerable you are, the more open you are and yeah. connected to the softness within you, yes. there henceforth that's where the yeah. nonviolent non communication is. And also the transparency. Ah, uh, the, transparency, yes. Back in 1970 I started studying it. University of Florida, and a man wrote a book called The Transparent Self, Sidney Girard. And he's saying that transparency invites transparency. If I'll be vulnerable, it makes you feel safe and it can open up your vulnerability. Or if I'm transparent, it can touch your transparency, then you want to be transparent with me. If we can get that going, the transparency creates the trust between us. If you can really, if we can each be transparent with each other, an energy of connection starts to happen. We start to feel trust for each other safe with each other. And then we can really negotiate and we can really resolve conflicts much easier once there's an est establishment of some trust between us. Well, let this be a moment where we segue into the title of your book. Okay. Uh, Don't Be Nice, Be Real. Why did you choose this title and what is your book about? Well, all my life I was taught things like express your anger nicely. And if that doesn't make you crazy, I don't know what does. <laughs> to express your anger nicely or you know, I was told um, that when I would be joyful and excited and want to move my body and be curious, I was told, you know, you're, you're having some kind of conniption, you're having a fit of some kind, or, you know, you're just too much for people. So I shut those things down, and then I would go dead inside and become depressed inside. So I wanted a new culture and a new language that inspires me and supports me in saying all of what's alive in me, what's authentic, alive, and true inside of me, and expressing that helps people feel safe with me and feel connected with me and gets my needs met better and I'm much less resentful because I noticed in my life I was a, born and raised to be a nice guy and I, I, I was a nice guy for a long time and the cost of that is tremendous depression, confusion, resentment I'm resentful because I'm not asking for what I want because to ask for what you want is not nice in our culture in a domination culture it's not nice to be assertive and ask for what you want it's only uh, it's only good for, it's only appropriate and good if people are nice dead people, or I call them sheeple. You call them sheeple. 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 They're they're conformed. They're ah. just one of the one of the sheep in the crowd, and that's what a society domination culture wants is for people to be nice dead sheeple. And the majority of the people, Kelly, are in this mode of just trying to please and to be nice and say short little answers. You ask somebody how they're doing that day and they will basically say, I'm okay. Yeah. Just just to show up to, to do the minimal, but they're not really yeah. saying the truth. They're just being, as your title of your book says, they're just being nice, but they're not really being authentic yeah. and being real. Well, both parties are just being nice. The one who's saying, how are you, a lot of times doesn't really want to know very much about what's going on with you. And then it doesn't feel very inviting. But it's wonderful to have a community and to grow a, a meme, a cultural meme of people who actually care about how you really are doing. When they ask you, how are you, they really want to know. And then that invites your energy to come forward a little better. So that's what I'm interested in, in general, is creating a culture, uh, a community, a tribe of people who really want to know how each other are and really want to find that communion and that connection between the two people. And you're actually doing something about that. You're creating all these micro communities. So let's speak about this and how Wonderful. this has come about. And this is my big passion. This is, this is what my heart really is pulled to do. And mm -hmm. I'm working on another book now called It Takes a Village to Raise a Consciousness. It's because of what I've come to. I worked for 20 years in San Diego and I taught thousands of people nonviolent communication. And to this day, I don't think there's a single practice group that's still happening because they didn't know how to become community. They didn't know how to become tribe. And it takes a village. It takes a, some local people to keep tra practicing like a language. If you're going to keep your Spanish fluent, you've got to hang out with Spanish-speaking people. So if you're going to keep your nonviolent communication consciousness going, you've got to hang out and practice with people who are practicing that. But it isn't happening in San Diego because I didn't, and none of us knew how to do We didn't have community building tools. 
We didn't know how to work through the archetypal conflicts that come up in community. We didn't have the right tools. We had a really good hammer. Nonviolent communication is the best hammer there is, the best communication tool I've ever found. But it isn't enough to have to work with the kind of issues that come up when you try to form a tribe. And tribes were there long before families were. Tribes were the original form of humanity. And I think we thrive best. We're pack animals. We're wolves. We're not swans. We're naturally in a pack of wolves. We're not dyads of two swans going down the, down the Danube River on their own. I think our nature thrives better in the soil of a, of a good, healthy, nonviolent tribe of people. Trusting, transparent, touching, toe-tapping, toe tree-hugging tribe <laughs> of people. So we have a lot of micro-communities we have several forming now. here in California. We have in Germany, yeah. a lot of different places. In Germany and Hawaii, there's a new culture center in Hawaii. There's uh, up in Eugene, Oregon, there's several hundred people there who are practicing these uh, tribal technologies, I call them. They're how an organism, like a tribe, communicates with itself. A tribe is like a, a human being, it's like an organism. And inside there's liver and lungs and heart and spleen and all that. And how they communicate with each other determines the health of that organism. So you need some kinds of forms or modalities to help that organism communicate with itself or to be transparent. So in our tribe, for example, we have a confidentiality rule. And the confidentiality rule is you can be confident if it's juicy, we're going to share it with everyone in the tribe. So everyone knows what's going on for real, so you can't gossip. You can't gossip in a transparent tribe because they already know what's going on. You can't exaggerate it or change it or use it to hurt people with. And that creates a certain safety. And we grow best, I think, in a safe environment. So when you say transparent, that's all your emotions. For instance, examples of that would be if you were feeling uh, fearful or if you were feeling extremely vulnerable. So you're going to say this to the group. Yes. And then in saying it, it releases you from it automatically. It releases you and connects with the other person. And it's more than just emotion. The interesting thing about transparency is also about your energy. Your energy, your emotions, it's everything. It's your thoughts. It's more than just the emotional dimension. And by expressing the energy of what's alive in me, I feel more connected on many levels with the other person. So when we, when we do set up these tribes, we teach them how to do something called the ZEG forum process. ZEG is a large intentional community eco-village in Europe. And they designed this thing called the ZEG forum. And people get up in the middle and they keep moving. They express, they don't just say, I'm angry. They show the anger, they move their bodies so it's congruent, so you can feel the energy of the anger. They don't just say, I'm sad. They let themselves fall on the ground and have the sadness and express it fully. And as it gets expressed fully, there's an energy change in the room. A field starts to get created in the room of trust and understanding and connection. And then we all feel this wonderful feeling, I call it sacred matrix home. We drop into this place of, Wow, this is communion, this is family, this is trust, this is community. And there's something very ecstatic about it. It's a spiritual experience when we drop into our transparent, open-hearted connectedness with each other. Well, Kelly, for those who are not living in an intentional community yeah. where this could be practiced, let's say well, that they're uh, the opposite of that, the ordinary, the conventional, would yeah. be that they're living in their own neighborhoods. So within that community, give me an example of what happens when you live in your own houses beside each other. Well, that's what we have now, mostly just networks. Mm -hmm. There's networks of people, and what we're trying to do, our, my ambitious goal is to have one of these networks within 20 miles of anyone who wants it, within bicycling distance. So people can come over and, and have a, a sit around and watch a movie together, or come together on Monday nights, and practice this process, this transparency connection process. But it's mostly about networks of people who just come together, come to different houses, uh, different places, and practice communing and practice what Eckhart Tolle talks about. Eckhart Tolle, in his book, The New Earth, he says, the new earth is going to come when people, small groups of people come together, not living together, but networks, who come together, drop their egos, and connect and commune with each other. That's the portal through which the New Earth Consciousness will come. Well, perfect vehicle for that would be uh, online, would be mm -hmm. Skype. Virtual communities. Virtual communities sure. and, and Facebook and yeah. uh, I'm doing all that the social with, media. I'm doing that now with a group in Germany. We have, we have uh, Skype sessions and I'll be on the Skype and they'll have like 15 people and we'll just do these different practices, what I call tribal technologies that help me get real, that help me drop my pretense, that help me drop my, my fears 
and help me open up to each other, little practices and processes. And I'll conduct them in that group, and they have an ongoing group that they keep growing together mm. as they practice these transparency processes with each other. Well, let's go back to your book. Mm -hmm. Don't be nice, be real. Mm -hmm. Li elaborate on the book. Uh, tell me about the different chapters and break it down as you Well, there's, there's a lot of different things to it. It's been a while, actually, since I've looked in it, because it's uh, three or f several years old now. Uh, but I tell stories about my travels in the Middle East and the Balkans and the northern, Cali northern uh, uh, Ireland, with the Protestants and Catholics, and different stories of examples of nonviolent communication where I practiced the process as best I knew how, from a real place, not from a being nice place, which is hard to do in Northern Ireland because they're such nicey nice people. And to get through the nice, to get through the cups of tea that you're being offered and to pierce through and get at what's real between people takes some courage sometimes. But it's done in the name of being wanting to be more connecting, finding out the aliveness, finding out the beauty in each other, being transparent. All of that. So they can see that and they can feel that. So I don't think that nobody's going to be rejecting it when they get a sense of what's actually going on. Well, if they trust the intention. There's a mm. lot of fear. A lot of times they don't trust the intention. They don't know where you're coming from, especially in war-torn areas like the Balkans or the Middle East or, or Northern Ireland. There's a lot of distrust, so you have to create some trust first between the people. Right. And the trust is established and that supersedes the newness of it, the unfamiliarness of it. Mm. And then the trust happens. Well, uh, part of the trust is, in order to create the trust, sometimes we have to bring the elephants onto the table, the elephants in the room onto the, the table. There's things people are like hiding. They, like when I did the workshop in Northern Ireland, we had Protestants and Catholics sitting down together who hated each other, who had violent intentions towards each other. And to start to bring that rage onto the table, to bring it out of the closet, that's actually what starts to create the trust. So we had to kind of like be provocative in some ways to bring the elephants onto the table so we start to create a field of, of safety and trust with each other, a safe, connected trust field. And what happens after you bring that out? All hell breaks loose. Yes. And then you've got to clean up the mess. Okay. But it's at the cleaning up the mess that the beauty comes in and the grace comes in and the healing comes in and the understanding comes in between people. As you get them to slow down, way slow, way, way, way down, take one little piece at a time and get each other to hear these one little small pieces of pain, of unmet needs, of incidents, real things that happened, and get people to hear each other in little pieces back and forth like a traffic cop. Then you start to weave a web of, of, of healing and trust and connection and understanding between people. And henceforth, as we spoke about before, that's where the giraffe and the jekyll's there. So the nastiness, the not so nice part of it, would be the jekyll, where they were accusing and blaming each right. other. Right. And then they start to rise above it, and they're shown that you could uh, drop down into a different place than that's being right. a jekyll. We can translate their jackal into into what we call giraffe. Mm -hmm. I remember, if I can remember it right, but like this one woman, she was a Catholic nun, and there was a Protestant priest, and I think the Protestant priest said something like, uh, "Granny talk, granny talk. That's all you're doing is granny talk." He says to the uh, to the Catholic nun, and she gets really furious, and she says, "How dare you insult my gender and my age all in one phrase?" You know. Now they're off to the races in their hatred and their war with each other. And what did he mean by granny talk? I'm not even sure what he really meant by it. It was something like he was bored. He wanted to be able to say preach or do something of it was more interesting to him. Mm. She was giving some liberal talk or something. Right. So that but, sort of insinuates granny talk of mm -hmm. that it's old, it's old fashioned, it's so it's right. out of date, so and therefore let's get let's bring in the new now and, and it was definitely right. insulting her. Right. He mm -hmm. she took it she took it personally because she didn't know how to listen with giraffe ears. Mm. Had she had giraffe ears, she would have just heard pain and unmet needs. Yes. And then she could have had connection with him. She could have had power with him. So let's break this down. So instead of her hearing that she's being insulted, yeah. she'd be hearing it that, she could what is he it. actually really saying to me? Right. What is the liveness in me? What is the positive that he's really saying, even though it doesn't sound like that? Well, what's the, what's the feelings and the needs? It's a simple way of doing it. What is he feeling? Bored. What is his need? Uh, more participation and connection with the conversation. When I hear it that way, I hear, I understand it's never about me. Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one can insult you without your permission. So this gives me a way to never be insulted, to never give somebody the power to insult me, because I'm just hearing what's alive, what they're feeling, what their needs are. 
and I might try to figure out what their observation is, what they're reacting to, and maybe even what is their request, what, what do they want right now. For those who have never heard about nonviolent communication, what would you say that the first things that they should do and in their lives that they're not doing right now? Well, on a hypothetical, let's say that they're, they're um, just going along and they're taking everything very personal. So, well, the first thing I would remind them is to Q-tip. Quit taking it personally. <laughs> and, and then to, I would recommend they get the book or CDs or call up the, the center and find out if there's a practice group near their area and to start to practice, practice hearing what's alive in other people without taking it personally. And even to check it out, if they get insulted somehow, to find someone who knows how to listen well so they can talk about the pain of receiving that insult, to receive what we call empathy, and let that pain kind of heal up a little bit. And then go to the person who insulted you and find out the truth. What were they feeling and needing? What were they observing? And if you do that, and if you have your heart open, you'll always feel compassion for the other person. So go beyond what is on the surface, mm -hmm. go deeper. And go the deeper. deeper part is really check into that other person and not be so much about yourself, being objective and looking at the other person and, connect, and wanting to connect to that other person. But only after I've gotten the empathy I need first for how I perceived it. I took it personally. I made it about me. I made your pain about something's wrong, something's bad in me. So now I'm wounded. I need empathy for that pain first to kind of clear that up so I can even come to a place of genuine wanting to know, wow, what made you say that? What were you feeling and needing? What, what did I say or do that triggered this or what happened that triggered this? That's lovely. But it has to come from my heart. It's got to be real, not because I should forgive yeah. them or I should make up. It's got to start with you first, That's and right. you resolve, and you yeah. become user-friendly to yourself, yeah. and then you extend that love and compassion to others. Yeah. Empathy to others. I like to get curious instead of furious. Wow, what made you call me a jerk? You know, what's that all about? This is fascinating. If I can really get curious, then I don't take it personally. I have presence to what is inside of them. And then I, then I notice that it's always either a call for love or an offering of love. Anything anybody's offering me is always an SOS or a care package. An SOS or a care package. Yeah, like a help, save yes. me, or it's a gift of some kind. Sometimes I don't recognize the gift that's being offered me. Hmm. Like I had, I was playing basketball the other day, and this, this big burly guy says something to me like, why don't you cut your nails? My fingernails. And at first I was insulted and, and frightened. I thought he was attacking me. And then I realized, oh my gosh, he's giving me a grooming tip. He wants me to stay in harmony with the other players by keeping my nails cut short so we don't accidentally scratch each other. Huh. So I saw the gift, finally, but at first I was seeing it as an attack. But the Course of Miracles says there are no attacks. There's just offerings of love and requests for love. That's it. Wonderful. And the communication helps me see that. Is there one chapter of your book that you really stands out amongst all the other chapters and that you really cherish? Well, well, the thing is, toward the end, I started to write about the thing I'm more into now, even, than the nonviolent communication. I started to write uh, the last chapter, the last two chapters, are actually on, it comes from Maury Schwartz's work. Uh, Maury Schwartz was a sociologist who had the interview with Ted Koppel just as he was dying. And, they, you, know, you know, the movie Tuesdays with Maury? Anyway, he was dying and he said, look, your culture is so sick, you need a new one. You can't fix the one you have. You've got to create a new one. You've got to start over and create a new one. And how to go about that, how to go about creating a support system so you can stay in satyagraha. Satyagraha means the soul force of nonviolence. It's the, the consciousness of nonviolence, the spirit of nonviolence. How can we stay and live and breathe and stay in that? I, I found that it's very difficult outside of the context of a field or a culture, a mini culture that supports that. So how to go about doing that and why that's so important for the world and for our individual selves. So the, going back to the community, it seems to be very important to keep the whole thing alive, nonviolent communication. It dies out. The mainstream is so focused on a domination trajectory. It's so focused on punishment and control and violence that, that we really will get sucked into it in fear. The vortex of fear will suck us in, the mortgage, mortgage crisis and all that. So potent, you'll get sucked into that unless you create another vortex, a vortex of trust of communion, of connection, of healing, of spirituality, to counteract that, I'll get sucked into that in consciousness. So 
it's important for me individually, but also I, I really see it as, this may be a little bit <laughs> outrageous, but I see it as how we're going to ever have peace on earth is by having decentralized tribes of people who resolve their own problems and empower themselves and not wait for the government to learn how to deal with their own issues of violence and illness and all the, and, and particularly another subject I'm particularly focused on is sex peace, peace between the sexes, between the genders, between the masculine and feminine, because I see that as a central problem. So essentially it breaks down to being very proactive and really connecting to yourself and having that within yourself and then extending that to others and building those communities that we're talking about. Yeah. And without that, is there really a, a hope for the, for the future of the world? I don't know. Where if we're all being taken care of, then yeah. that's opening up the door for they can do whatever they want to us, the governments or the powers yeah. to be. So mm. it's really our the most important answer in all of this is really empowering oneself. Taking our power. And, and we can only do that, I believe, in the context of a tribe. It, you can't be autonomous, you can't really be fully empowered outside of the field of a tribe of people, a social group that, that's holding that intention of empowerment and healing. You can't, I mean, you could try to be Thor Heyerdahl and sail the Contiki across the Pacific Ocean by yourself. The first person to ever go across the ocean, you know, was, was like in a canoe by himself. But I, I'm not that strong. I'm not Deepak Chopra or these spiritual people who are so powerful they could do it on their own. I need the love boat. I need an ocean cruise liner to help me, give me the strength and the support to get across these things, to do this work. So let's go on the inside of the, the, the dynamics of the community of what would be happening there. My. Is there a whole anarchy going on there of different levels of people? I wouldn't call it an anarchy. I would call it a Gailanic culture, mm -hmm. where there's equal respect for the masculine and feminine. And people understand that, that there is this thing called rank. People have more ability at cooking than other people, and some people are better at computers than other people. And as each person finds their right niche, the right place, then the whole community comes alive, then a synergy happens, and then the whole thing becomes a well-oiled machine. If they find their the choir director finds her niche, and the, and the cook finds her niche, and these different roles, and then if the community can pick a project that has passion for them, that has power for them, something that's hard, it's not easy, but it's not too hard. It's just hard enough to bring their energy forward and to inspire them to bring forth their, their power and their courage to really jump into something that has heart for them, a passionate project. It's just hard enough to inspire, but not so hard to discourage them. All right. well, let's break it down for the uh, urban community of the yeah, cities. The networks, yeah. So what would be that like in the workforce that everybody's having their career, yeah. they have their office, they yeah. go to, then they go back to their homes, their units, yeah. and most people don't know their neighbors. Some do, but yeah. very few people are getting to know well, their neighbors and their communities. Their communities today. like this, like in, like in Ghana, the Ghana community in uh, Staten Island. Mm -hmm. and what they did was, over a period of time, they actually bought up all the houses in one neighborhood. So they all live very close to each other, as close as they can to each other. And so they have meetings every morning. They'll have meetings. And they'll have frequent uh, gatherings where they come together to commune and to play and to party and to sing together, to dance together, to, to grow together, to process together. And they do this as frequently as they can. And this builds a certain like bond in the community. And it builds a certain growth in a field. It grows a field of consciousness in the community. And then as they become powerful and organized, then they can take on projects even political projects, whatever their, whatever, wherever their hearts are pulled to, to put their energies. But Kelly, I'm thinking that it also could be woven throughout the society without people even knowing what's going on. Um, it, ideally, it would be that there's conscious communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But let's say at the workforce, uh, mm -hmm. this could be woven in there. Oh, absolutely. And one person, such as yourself, let's say if you were working in such and such company, mm -hmm. yeah. And you would be doing this, right? And people would know what you're doing, but they would be kind of pulled into it, and they would see how they would be feeling better instead of going into the mm. conflict mode or in the judgment mode. Yeah. So it's if one person knows about it, then they can be introducing it, and then yeah. people will start to be inspired by that, and they will start asking others yeah. what is actually well, going on. Well, that's how it happens. That's that's what people get. 
people feel a certain centeredness or a calmness or a certain proficiency in communication. Uh -huh. And they're attracted to that. They feel a power and a responsibility and an integrity that people have and a warmth that people have when they're centered in their hearts. And they're attracted to that and then they're invited to come and, hey, why don't you come and let's, let's have this evening together and look at these new culture concepts and see if you're interested and see if you want to share with us. Right. And it affects, it also creates a, a vibration in the culture. Uh, however, whatever degree I'm really at peace, that's how much peace I can offer. And people will feel that and it'll affect the cultural field, even the workplace. What's wonderful in my mind would be to have people learn these what I call tribal technologies or these modalities for new culture and next culture and bring it into the workplace so we can create a culture of connection instead of coercion to get things done and how to create synergy and how to create group entrainment where people learn how to operate as a one mind group of people. It's very interesting to watch how how groups can become one mind and really work much more efficiently. Opposed to the competitiveness. Opposed to the competitiveness and the ego and all that stuff, how to drop that, become a good team. Like, a, like I'm really into basketball and when a team is clicking, there's no ego on the table. Everyone is really sharing equally with each other and passing and they're not just shooting all the time. And it becomes a very powerful field of, it's much more powerful than each individual. You find more power in the group, one on one becomes 11 in that. So this, what we're speaking about, is this known to be a natural, innate uh, way of being for people? I or think, we are naturally a competitive human race? I think, I think we're naturally empathic. There's, Jeremy Rifkin has a whole video on the empathic civilization, and we've survived because we're connected. We're, we're group animals, and we actually thrive on connection, support, synergy with each other more than competition against each other. And you really see this when you, a major disaster happens, yeah. that all yeah. these cities and, and, and the communities where neighbors had never spoken to each other, uh, um, then they start to connect, yeah. uh, such as the 9-11, yeah. great, yeah. great uh, uh, waves of compassion, yeah. where in Japan, uh, when they had their disaster, the nuclear fall, that Japan was naturally there to be empathetic to each other yeah. and helping. Where Americans, they're not so much about that as Japan is, mm. but they became like that yeah. in these major I think disasters. we're growing into it. I think as the world reaches its certain crises and certain problems, it's kind of nudging us in that direction. Then you see what people are really made of, like what's really, what human beings are really about. What's the truth of the, the people? Truth. Yes. The other day I was driving down, it's actually a couple years ago, I was driving down 880 in San Francisco. And this car in front of me started to flip. It was an SUV and it started to swerve and it started flipping and it flipped several times. And I felt this amazing calm come over me. I pulled my car over with all this glass everywhere and four or five people had gotten out of their cars and were stopping the traffic at risk of their own lives to make sure this person didn't get hit. And it was a beautiful field of compassion and power and presence. And you could just see people's hearts just come out naturally. And they protected this person who'd gotten flipped out of their car, whatever it was, and I could feel the, the feel, the power of the compassion, and I could see in people's hearts and eyes, wow, those people are risking their lives for a total stranger. And this is what human beings are really made of. And this is the, the IntelliKey, the, the, the field that we have to tap and bring together and commune together to become really strong and to have a powerful field effect to create the cultural change that we've been trying to do individually. Right. Uh, just recently, I came across a viral photo mm. of a black African uh, runner. They were in a running competition, uh -huh. and she was uh, ahead to, to become first, and oh, she was yeah. going to win oh, a lot yeah. of money. I heard about this. Yes, and there was this uh, uh, runner that she was passing, yeah. and he was with no limbs, yeah. uh, arms, right. and um, and she stopped. She paused to, yeah. to give him water yeah. because she saw that he was struggling and he, he was in this mode of, of dehydration. And as a result, she came in second where she would be coming yeah. in first and yeah. she would have won this great amount of money. Yeah. But at that moment, it was yeah. all about reaching out and that empathy and that compassion to others. Yeah. So this is our natural state this of being. This is it. This is how we are. This is how we are until we become socialized. And our behaviors sometimes will demonstrate and yeah. show difference than that. Yeah. They have behaviors will start to become more in sensitivity and yeah. competitive. Scarcity and, and settings of scarcity. 
Eva Jane Goodall, the monkeys didn't become violent until she put little boxes of bananas that were limited, and then they started to compete. Up until that time, the monkeys she'd been working with weren't violent. So in certain settings, where there's uh, a setup where there's scarcity, or the worst one, and this is very controversial, I think it's okay to say, yes. is that, is that uh, cultures that use punishment in any way. Because when you use punishments in any way, in a culture or in a family, you create fear. You create cooperation based on fear, not on compassion and connection. And so it becomes very scary to really be in touch with your true nature. You, you can't really be in touch with your true nature and to be weak and vulnerable because you've got to be strong to, to, to fight these people who are willing to use power over against you. And it destroys transparency. You, you can't be honest in a punishment culture. You have to be stupid, Marshall Rosenberg says, to be honest in a culture that punishes. And we are in a punishing society. We are, and that's why we don't have the resources to protect our people. We're using all of our resources. The biggest business, I think, in California is prison building. We're using all our resources to punish and we don't have the resources to protect people anymore. And that's how I'd like to see our resources used to intervene to protect, never to punish, and to create a cultural field of working out these problems transparently in the open so we can really work with them instead of having them be these dark places that bust out in forms of violence. Because when one feels that they're going to be punished, and henceforth that leads into judgment and leads mm -hmm. into the, the jekyll. And the hiding. So, and they're not being open with each other, and that creates an isolation and a separation. And all these violent crimes are, most of them are by people who are very isolated in some way. They're not connected empathically with other people. So there sounds to be so much freedom in this well, nonviolent communication. In nonviolent communication and learning how to create a community that doesn't judge, that holds space for people, very sacred space and very presently, so people can get at and move through these violent negative energies that would get acted out in the community, but they don't have to be acted out if they're just expressed in theater form and be heard and have people really empathize with them and hear them and not put any judgment on those people, not try to coerce them into any particular style as it relates to their sexuality, their spirituality, love or their resources, but just lets them find and do their own experiment to find out what's, what makes sense to them, what is their heart telling them their own path is supporting each individual in their own path instead of trying to get them to conform and become sheeple. Right. You're saying something very important there that the experiential and in that experiential it, it leads into celebration of life. Yeah. And this is so beautiful. Absolutely. And this is why we are here as a human species to be yeah. celebrating life. Partying and, and creating and being creative and celebrating. And co-creating together. And having that synergy together all the time. You, I wish you all you all could come to our events. We do these one-day events and we just did a spring camp event. And what we do during the day, we work on shadow parts. The rage, the hurt, the pain, the disempowerment, the fears, the different things. We work on that and we work it out in our forum processes. And then at night we party. We dance like fools and just sing. And it's so richer and so much higher once you've let go of the, the sandbags of the shadow side. Then the ability to party and connect and commune is so much deeper and richer than it is when you're carrying all this other stuff. I don't trust a culture that doesn't party and dance. Yes. <laughs> and so party, the, a culture that is not partying and dancing and celebrating is a culture that is really not connected to themselves. Right. They're being yeah. controlled, basically. Being controlled. And or they're, they're all caught up in their addictions and they're trying to avoid their pains because they don't have any place to clear them. So when they're dancing, it's not really very energetic. It's not very, it's not really joyful. It's like a heavy dance. Well, this is very important. Let, let's speak a little bit more on this, people who are doing that. Well, look in a bar, just go into the bars up and down the streets. And a lot of people are really trying to keep themselves numb out of the anxieties, out of the fears, out of the confrontations. They're not really clear in their own beings and bodies. So that when they are trying to celebrate, it isn't with the same juice than it is when you've done some work on that. And in that numbness, they're actually afraid of their, their own energy, their own power. They're suppressing themselves yeah. to be lesser than, than yeah. who they are. Well, I, I, I can't say The shadow say side, I'm, as you say. Yeah, I can't say I'm beyond that. I'm still healing about that. And mm -hmm. I've been working very hard on it. But, but even I've come to places where I'm frozen because I'm trying to stay safe. 
in some way. I'm trying not to be too powerful or too wonderful or too expressive because I don't want to trigger other people and not feel safe sometimes. So it helps me to have a community that's helping me heal from that and creating a safe place for me to really truly, totally, authentically, fully be myself, to have a fully lived life and expression, really strong so that when I'm in the other culture, I don't tend to lose myself so badly because I know who I am in this, in this tribe. So an example of that would be to find your perfect balance, the middle ground within oneself. The balance I'm not understanding. The balance of who you are, of the oh. acceptance of oneself. Yeah, and, and that's a growing, evolving process, and I actually need help. I can't even understand myself out of the context of community. I don't really even know who I am without mirrors. And I need those mirrors and that feedback to even grow, to even see my blind spots. Uh, I can, here's an example of this. is There's a wonderful man named Thomas Hubel, very popular in the area lately. And he creates we communities, he calls them. And he has these big conferences in Europe and every year. And he brings all the top names, the big gurus, the people like Deepak Chopra and those kind of people. Dr. Wayne Dreyer. Those kinds of people. Yes. And he brings them together in a room before he's going to you know, be on stage together. And he says they make a horrible intersubjective community space because they only know how to be leaders. They don't know how to be communitarians. They don't know how to share the space with each other because they don't belong to a club it really is of their peers. It's of people who are subservient to them or subordinate to them. So when they all get in a room together, it's a big battle for the floor. They're all like fighting for who's going to speak next and who's going to say what. And it's kind of a competition that gets going instead of a collaboration and a connection because they've never learned how to be communitarians together, how to create a communal space together. And I thought that was fascinating. So it brings me around to the understanding that we need a sangha or some peers, some some bullshit detectors <laughs> so they can tell us the truth about ourselves so we can grow spiritually and not just become well-developed egos. So I'm hearing it very clearly that community is the be-all and is-all and without it what chance do we have and it really is where the answers lie. I think so. I mean I mean, nonviolent communication is powerful, it's very useful, and it'll change your life. If you practice it, it will change your life and your relationships completely. Mm -hmm. And... Oh, I like to say it gives you that measured results. It gives you real results very yes. quickly. It'll change your family life just right away if you, if you apply it and really live it. But even as you live it, it's a, it's a culture, it's a, it's a consciousness of connection for creating collaboration instead of correction or instead of coercion. So it changes the field in any small family, any small group. And it wants to, it calls out, I think, for a larger context so we can grow into the rich, deep, expressive areas of our lives. All the complexities. I need a village in order to get at all the complexities of my own personality and bring those out. Kelly, do you think in the last 10 years that we are moving more towards oh, yeah. community or moving more away from Especially in the last communities. five years, there's like a there's like a wave coming in the last five years or so. I think a lot of people, the light's coming on, we're realizing. Just like in the 60s, there was like a wave of cultural, these cultural memes started to come in that were, they were almost like from beyond somewhere. So I think it's really starting to happen now that we're seeing that we absolutely need each other. We need each other, particularly as things get socially unstable. We need true social security, a spiritual social security that's based on love and connection and a new kind of love that isn't about transaction or commerce, but is about unconditional love, that is about love without needing anything in return, without looking for something back, in man-woman relationships, in child-parent relationships, in all relationships. Right, they say love without a receipt, yeah, love an without, invoice. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yes. So I think that's part of it. We're seeing how we need that. We need to practice that and create those fields with each other to support and sustain each other to stay out of these vortexes of fear and stay in the vortex of trust. And again, it's very important to point out that it happens within inside ourselves first and that manifests within and then we extend it without to others. And and I and I don't want to wait to become perfect to I'm joining these communities, becoming part of these communities because I want to evolve. I want to deal with my shadow stuff and my blind spots and that and I need the community to do that. I don't need to be perfect yes. to enter and be a part of these these transparency tribes. And yes, it helps me 
come to a place of more peace so I have more peace to give, if I have more peace inside. And others can be a catalyst yeah. for you, for your growth. Exactly. And as you say, the shadow side. Yeah. So there's a beautiful symbiotic dance going on yeah. there. And we're not looking for perfection, we're looking for the experiential mm. of all mm. of it. And it's an mm. ongoing process. Yeah, and it doesn't even matter though, the perfection. Like when we do our camps and things, we have a five day spring camp and, and things mess up and whatever, but the overall overarching feeling of we are a loving community together, it doesn't matter if, if the water doesn't work so, bad, so well or uh, something is broken, whatever. What feels wonderful is this overarching sense of we love each other, we're in a field of trust and honesty with each other, we're growing together. And then our imperfections are, you know, they're not even seen as imperfections. They're just beautiful nuances of the diversity of human expression. I'd like to go back to the title of your book again, Don't yeah. Be Nice, mm -hmm. Be Real. Were you seeing a lot of this throughout your years of being in, with, working with others and, and just meeting with others and throughout your it's travels tragic. that we're, people we're, were just uh, not being themselves? All over. Like, so many societies are training people to be robots and to not be real. And what that does in terms of the intimacy, it just deadens it, it kills it. It's tragic for me to see it in families and because and, 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 I'm a marriage and family therapist, so I see it particularly in the family, the family unit. People aren't being real with each other and they're not creating the connection of intimacy with each other and then the love dies. And it's sad for me to watch this between parents and kids particularly. So essentially, a lot of people, what they're doing is they are with practice manners and they are practicing the cultural, the social, the religious, the political, yeah, and all. all of these things, instead of everything that's outside of themselves, everything that is determined the way you should be, but not allowing them to be who they really are. Not really supporting them and finding their authentic expression of themselves. I mean, we give lip service to it, but... Do we really support it energetically? When your child yells back at you, no, I'm not going to do what you tell me. Are you able to support them in that expression? Are you able to have empathy at that moment? Or do you tell them, don't you tell me no, and, and fight back? It's tragic. And it's partly the cultural rules and the cultural memes that, that if you have certain kinds of cultural rules and memes in your family, it supports authenticity and self-expression and, and a true higher level of morality. But if you have a be nice, be a good girl kind of thing, then you develop at level two of, morale, of moral expression. Piaget and Colbert talk about levels of moral development. Level two is good boy, nice girl. You do things, you don't cheat at cards or whatever because you want to get a good pat on the head and be a good person. But at these higher levels, it's because you care about other people. You don't cheat on cards because you want people to feel trusted, cared for. And usually these people who act that certain way of being the good person yeah. and keeping it inside, they reign it inside for so long, right. particularly when they're young, then it explodes in, in the opposite way when it they become older. It either explodes or it implodes. Implodes. It becomes disease yeah. or becomes violent expression in some way. It builds up and blows up or it implodes inwardly and people develop all kinds of physical illnesses related to it. But it's a simple thing that you could start to introduce these memes, I call them cultural memes, ideas, and peace knowledge. You can introduce it into your family, into a tribe, into a culture. They're very simple, some of them. I, I want to tell you one that runs my family. I have a daughter, she's t 13, and uh, part her mother. We live on the same compound together. We have a rule, one rule guides our whole family, and it's very beautiful. The rule is, no one in our family is allowed to give in to each other. No one's allowed to be nice and give in. So, we tell the truth. If we don't want to do something, we, we speak up about it, we keep talking about it, until either shift or synergy happens. Until someone gives to someone, or we figure out another way to do it. And it always works, every time, so far. I'll give you a little example is, I came home the other day and my daughter says to me, Daddy, let's play badminton. Or she called it good mitten because we live in Santa Cruz. It's politically correct. She says, let's play good mitten. And I says something very violent to her. I said, okay. And she says, no way, Daddy, you're giving in. I can tell, you're giving in. And whenever you give in, this is how you play badminton. Na 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 na. And it's no fun to play with you when you're giving in, Daddy. She, so I said to her, I said, "Well, do you want me to tell you the truth?" She says, "Duh," in her teenage way. You know. I said, "Okay. Well, the truth is, 
I'm tired, I want to rest, I'd like to hang out with you and be with you and play with you, but I don't want to do anything heavy duty physical. She says, Daddy, that's fine. You lay down in your bed, I'll get some paper mache and some pipe cleaners, I'll make things, and all you have to do is tell me how beautiful they are. <laughs> I said, that works for me. Thank you for not giving in, for staying with it until we found a real win-win for both of us. So that's a cultural meme that we're introducing in our family that helps us not create resentment and giving in and depression with each other and keeps us more connected with each other. That's one of the kind of little memes you can introduce to a family or a culture. There's several of them. There's at least 12, 12 that I'm aware of. There's 12. Well, there's, what are there's some a, of the others? Well, they have to do with, it's called the 12 Theses for Nonviolence. And it's a different perspectives on home and family life and on sexuality, a healthy sexuality, what that's about, and on commerce and on ecology, and recovering the lost relationships with nature, with community, and with the man-woman problem, the, the patriarchy-matriarchy thing. Hmm. So it's new perspectives on those things and how they all have to work together kind of in a nested way. You can't just separate them out. They need to have be kind of a holistic working together of these things. Do you write about these in your book? Uh, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm working on doing some interviews and things on this. It takes a village to raise a, a consciousness. So you'll be speaking about but those yes, more that, in your second actually, book? Actually, the 12 theses are in my current book, in the nonviolent, I mean, in the uh, Don't Be Nice, Be Real. There is a list of the 12 theses for nonviolent culture. And your second book will be released? We don't know yet. Okay. Uh, when, when, I, when the divine design tells me it's time. You're working on it. Yeah. All right. Mm. Well, it was absolutely an oh my goodness. pleasure. Is the time gone by already? Absolutely. Wow. That yes. felt like just a minute. Absolutely. <laughs> we have so much more to speak about, and I'd like to invite you back again, and we'll talk definitely about more about the communities. Wonderful. And it's been a great pleasure and a great, great honor to meet you, Kelly. It was wonderful being with you. I loved how you were so participatory and interactive, and you brought it out of me, and you kept it alive. Felt like just seconds went by. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And from the art of conscious living, please do take care of yourself and take care of others. Thank you.